this uh, young woman presented with this tooth. And you can see the decay and all the tooth structure that's gone. I saw a new patient yesterday and the entire inner part of the tooth was eaten away on a cuspid tooth and I suggested to her she have the tooth that we extract the tooth and place an implant. How do you decide? I love endo. There'll always be a place for endo. But if the to tooth is too badly broken down, then you may want to consider extracting the tooth and placing an implant. If you do the implant procedure correctly, that implanted, uh, I mean that implant abutment and crown should be the best person, best tooth in the person's mouth if you do it right and give it time to heal. Don't load it immediately. I, I want to say that we, I can't, I don't think I've ever lost a root form implant because I never load them for three months. If they've, if it's in the aesthetic zone, they wear a flipper or if I'm restoring the teeth around it, it may be a, a provisional bridge, but I don't ever place the abutment and crown on the implant at the time of implant placement. I grew up ranching in West Texas and so it's like putting a fence post in concrete. If you move that fence post before the concrete set, you've got a pretty good chance of the fence post coming loose. So give it three months, <coughs> give the implant three months for the bone to osseointegrate into the titanium. Don't load it immediately. All right, so in this case, there was plenty of tooth structure remaining. It's a molar tooth, and I'm going to show you how we cleaned it out and then performed the real-world endo uh, technique and placed a crown. So this is a before and after of the endo technique. We're only going to show the endodontic technique. You can see this is a uh, three-rooted molar tooth, and this is before and after. So painless anesthesia, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to give painless and profound local anesthesia. Believe me, if you'll use this technique, the patient will never feel anything and the tooth will be completely numb. One of the keys is if you're performing endodontics or a crown or something of consequence, you must give intraligamental local anesthesia in addition to an infiltration or a block. If you're just using infiltration and a block for the man, infiltration for the maxillary, infiltration for the man, mandibular, a percentage of your patients is not, are not going to be numb. And that is patient's greatest fear that they're gonna feel something, especially if you're doing a root canal. That word just strikes fear into the hearts of patients. I had a friend that was an endodontist that said when any time he would he joined a new Sunday school class at his church and he he couldn't tell him what he did because if he said he was an endodontist somebody would always yell out he does root canals so root canals because of the old time way they used to do them without local anesthesia or just ineffective techniques scares people to death so if you can make your patients totally comfortable so they don't feel anything and even the local anesthesia is totally comfortable, you are probably going to have a very good practice because that reputation will get out. So learn how to give completely painless anesthesia. Subscribe to DentistryMasterClasses.com. Come on, it's only 20 bucks a month, and you get all the Dental Minute videos and all the comprehensive case videos <coughs> in an organized library. Just go over them and over them and over them so when you perform the procedure, you've got it. I never learn anything the first time. I have to go over it several times and hear it several times because you're ready to hear a different way. You know, golf swing videos, I need to watch them two or three times because there's always some key part I missed the first time. So de subscribe to DentistryMasterClasses.com. If they're no good, unsubscribe. But I promise you, you're going to love them. We're putting out new videos every week, and uh, we're putting out many comprehensive, complete cases every week that aren't in the Dental Minute videos. So local anesthesia, painless and profound. Here's the intraligamental. You turn the, the bevel of the needle toward the tooth. Now you spray it with topical spray, hurricane topical spray, 
before you place the needle and just barely place it in the sulcus and just tap the end of it so that you anesthetize the tissue ahead of the needle and ahead of the of putting of a, a forceful pressure on the syringe. But you have, here's intraligamental again. Watch this video on how to use a quick and easy rubber dam placement. Let's face it, most dentists don't use rubber dam because the technique is too complicated. You don't like the pieces between the teeth. This is something I worked out years ago. That is it as good as the old time technique where you floss every green piece between the teeth? Eh, maybe not, but it's excellent. And it, what it does, it keeps the water out of the mouth. It's not completely sealed, but it's close to sealed because you don't cut a bunch of holes here. You just cut two or three so it's tight on the teeth. It keeps any pieces of old amalgam that you're cutting out of the tooth, like I said, in the water out of the mouth. It keeps the tongue and the lips and the cheeks out of the way, which is fantastic for a million reasons. I use this technique on almost every procedure, many times even when I'm extracting a tooth, because it keeps the tongue and the cheek and the lips out of the way and keeps 99.9% .9 of the water out of the mouth and pieces of tooth and old filling and what have you from falling in the mouth so you don't have to worry about the patient aspirating. So, learn, word to the wise, learn this technique and use it every day. I can place this rubber dam with my assistant probably in about 15 seconds. It's so easy. All right, I'm first preparing the tooth for a crown. If I'm performing endo, I normally, and a crown, I normally prep the tooth for a crown just to get that behind us and then perform the endo. This occlusal reduction burr for a molar, very effective. Then this is just a coarse football diamond. And you can use a number of different diamonds for tooth preparation. I'm using this for my initial uh, facial palatal prep because it's coarse and it cuts quickly. I'm performing endo anyway and remove the bulk of the tooth and then come back with interproximally with the flame-shaped fine diamond. This is that coarse football diamond again, just removing the decay. There's a nerve of the tooth. Now once I find the nerve or the pulp chamber, I always anesthetize again into the pulp chamber. So I've done it on a maxillary tooth. I've done an infiltration injection. I've done an intraligamental injection. And now I'm doing an intrapulpal injection. There is no way the patient is going to feel anything and they will Sing my praises because not only is the endodontic technique terrific, but they didn't feel anything and they weren't expecting that. Because if they've been to any of you before they came to me, they probably felt something. <laughs> Nothing against you, but in dental school, they didn't teach you this technique. So use this local anesthetic technique. So I'm being sure that there is nothing in that tooth alive that the patient can feel. This is just a round burr with slow speed removing. No, now with this, okay, I'm backing up a little bit. Anytime there's decay interproximally, there's always going to be decay on both the teeth interproximally, on the mesial tooth and the distal tooth. So if you prep the tooth, one of the teeth for a crown or an inlay, you've got access to the decay on the tooth adjacent to it. I do not place large composite fillings, period. I don't do it. Why don't I? Number one, the coefficient of thermal expansion of a composite filling is 75 or 80. The coefficient of thermal expansion of a tooth is 11. Remember, that's how much a, a material expands and contracts when exposed to hot and cold. The larger the composite filling, the more coefficient of thermal expansion comes into play, meaning when the patient drinks something hot and cold, that filling is moving, whereas the tooth is not moving as much. It's only got a coefficient of thermal expansion of 11. The composite is 
75 or 80. So that filling's going like this and the tooth's going like this. That's why they pull away from the teeth. Plus composite filling stain and leak. Small composite filling is great because the coefficient of thermal expansion differential is not that significant between a tooth and a composite. But as they get big, it really becomes significant. So I place either processed inlays. My favorite is a gold inlay if it's just a mesial restaurant like an MO if, and it's very conservative so you've got lots of tooth structure left or a crown. But in this case we had a mesial decay on the second molar so I'm removing that decay and I'm going to place a very conservative composite filling right there so the patient doesn't have to have an inlay. So a crown and a composite. I'm removing the decay, etching with 38% phosphoric acid. Now remember, you can etch enamel as much as you want. I'll normally etch enamel for 45 seconds to a minute. You only want to etch dentin for 15 seconds. So if you've got dentin and enamel, place, it on the, place the etch on the enamel first and leave it for 30 seconds. Then come back at the end and place it on the dentin for 15 seconds. Then rinse it thoroughly. Then this is primer adhesive. I use uh, 3M Gotch Bond. Then always cure the primer adhesive before you place the filled resin, before you place the composite. Always cure it before you place the filled resin, except when you're seeding a veneer. In a, the cases of veneer, you don't cure it before you seed the veneer, but always blow it off because you want, want to get rid of the acetone or alcohol carrier that's in the primer adhesive. Because that primer, that acetone is, is attracted to water. So if you leave it just a little bit damp, it pulls that primer into the dentinal tubules and you get the hybrid layer. Very important, but you want to blow it off after you place it, before you cure it, to get rid of that acetone carrier or it can weaken the bond strength. So I blew it off, then I cured it. Now I'm placing a flowable composite, and I like Filtech for no good reason, just I've used it and it works. Then I cured that, now I'm polishing it with a flame-shaped diamond, and then I'll come back with either a 30-fluted or a 12-fluted carbide burr. This is a 12-fluted carbide burr for the final polish. So here's the composite. I could do the, place a composite here because I gained access when I, pl when I prepped the tooth for a crown. Okay, you want direct access to the canals. So don't, if these are the canals right here, you don't want to have to go this way to get into the canal. You want to go straight into the canal. So open the, the uh, orifice enough that you can go straight into the canal. This is a fine chamfer diamond. This is a flame-shaped diamond, and I'm doing my final preparatory margins with the chamfer diamond and the flame-shaped diamond. Then I'm just cleaning out. Here's my access opening. Now, these are the things that you need to perform a root canal these days, end of these days. This scout file is invaluable for finding canals. If you've got an elderly person or somebody with sclerotic canals, this is a gem for finding canals. Once you make the access opening, if you can't find that canal, just take this on your handpiece and just poke on the roof of the chamber. And if it's there, you'll find it with that scout file. Then come back with the headstrom or the K files. And I use a uh, size 10, 25 millimeter, and clean out the nerve from the canals. Irrigate with three to one water to sodium hypochlorite. Three parts water, one part sodium hypochlorite. And I just leave that in the pulp chamber and clean it out with these headstrom files. I really like a headstrom file because it cleans real well. Or you can use a K, K file and clean that out and then use your apex locator on the headstrom or the K file to tell you if you've got the right length. You want to be half a millimeter 
from the clinical apex. And so once I've done that, I go with this file, which is the a 25 0 0.4, 0 0.030, and it's an EJ02. But see how it's, it's squiggly looking. I can't imagine how somebody figured out this would work. But you put that in the canal and it just cleans it so well and gets all the, the uh, nerve material out of the canal, does a wonderful job, and you only have to use one file. You just use one file. Once you've filed it with your headstrom or your K file, and this is very important because if you ever did separate a handpiece driven file, you've cleaned out the nerve and it's not so important that you retrieve that separated file. Now, in all the time I've been using this EJ02 file, the curvy one, I've, I hate to even say this, I've never separated a file. It's very durable, very durable, much more durable than the individual file, uh, hand, I mean, uh, mechanical files we used to use with the Brasler system. So it's very flexible and it doesn't separate easily. Like I said, I've never separated one, but if it ever happened, if you filed it out with these hand files first and remove 99.9% .9 of the nerve material with the sodium hypochlorite in the canal, then if you ever did separate a file, it's not so critical that you retrieve the file because retrieving a separated file is not a benign procedure. You could perforate the root of the tooth. If you didn't have to retrieve it, you'd rather not. So clean it out with the hand files first. Find the canal with the scalp file if it's garrotic. Clean it out with the hand files and irrigate with the sodium hypochlorite. Then come back with the EJO2 single file on the handpiece. Okay, so I'm first using my hand file and use your applicator on your computer, your measuring device, to measure the length of the canal so you've got an approximate length before you start using the hand file. Always curve the file before you place it in the canal. Now fill the pulp chamber with sodium hypochlorite just cleaning, 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 trying not to go past the apex of the canal. Now I'm measuring with my apex locator, that's perfect, 0 0.5. You want to be 0 0.5 millimeters from the apex. Measuring the next canal, filling the pulp chamber with sodium hypochlorite, and I'll just, you can see it's still in the pulp chamber. Now I'm going to my second canal, and just cleaning 99.9% .9 of the nerve material out of the canal with the hand file. I haven't placed a, a handpiece driven drill in the canal yet. And again, 0 0.5 on that second one. And here's the third one. And you always curve the canal and kind of roll it in, turning your hand, curve file, just kind of, don't stick it straight in, kind of jiggle it as you go in, roll it about half a turn each way as you go into the canal and it'll just trace that canal, get to the end of the canal and measure, and this is 0 0.5. All right, now we're going with the EJO2. So we know the length of the canals. We're gonna fill the, the pulp chamber with sodium hypochlorite and then just move it up and down. Now I move it up and down in each canal about 10 or 15 times, but I don't drive it in. I just let it pull itself in, let it bite and go into the canal, then pull it back, and I'll go 10 or 15 strokes in each canal. It's very quick, very efficient. Then irrigate and go to the next canal. Just let it, just once it bites a little bit, pull it back up. So you go in, it bites, pull it back up. It'll go a little further the next time. It bites, pull it back up, and you know you want to go to the bottom of the stopper against the side of the tooth. I keep checking, every time I go into a different canal, I check the length of the drill. I'm irrigating again with sodium hypochlorite, not under pressure, just filling the pulp chamber. Here we're going into the third one. Now what if you can't, what if it binds and you can't go in? Go back with your hand file, with that Hestrom hand file, and open it up a little bit more. 
it's normally not going to do that. Don't push hard. Just go in and let it bite and then pull it out. And then each time you'll go in a little bit further and do that 10 or 15 times in each canal and you'll clean them out beautifully. Then irrigating. And then this is just uh, a local anesthetic in a syringe. The only reason I'm using local anesthetic is because that's a 30 gauge needle and it fits the canal perfectly. So I'm not placing the tip of the needle in the canal under pressure. I'm just placing it at the coronal part of the canal and filling it up and floating any debris in the canal to the pulp chamber, just cleaning it out. So somebody asked me, what's the significance of using local anesthetic? None. You could use water. It's just that the needle on the syringe is a 30 gauge needle, which is perfect for irrigating the sodium hypochlorite out of the canal. All right, so here's the MB2. <clears throat> and MB2, you know, sometimes you can get an MB2 and sometimes you can. I try to clean them out if I can. Okay, so now once you've, once you've used that file, that drill, the EJO2, the nice thing about it, it's a 30 gutter percha cone, 99% of the time. Sometimes you've got to drop down to a 25 but nine out of 10 times, it's a 30 gutta percha cone. And so you, you just pull three 30 gutta percha cones, place them in the canals. Take a periaqual radiograph. Those are good. Gonna irrigate it again with my sodium hypochlorite. Be sure they're patent again with my hand file. And then I'm going to irrigate it once more with the sodium hypochlorite. And then this is the local anesthetic with a 30 gauge syringe just to rinse most of the, rinse the debris or sodium hypochlorite out of the canals. It's not under pressure. Now, what do you do if a canal is still bleeding after you've done this? Say so it was very hyperemic and still bleeding. Well, what I do is place a lidocaine uh, 2% 1 to 100,000 carpule in the syringe and inject directly into the canal into the canal with that little bit of epinephrine most of the time that will stop the bleeding but if you still do have a little bleeding just dry it out real well with the cotton uh, with the paper points and fill it you know sometimes you can't stop all the bleeding so here's the paper point and I'll Many times I'll leave the paper points in the canal for a while just to let it stop the bleeding. Just let it sit there for a few minutes. And then this is the endo sequence BC sealer. You're gonna inject that under a little bit of pressure into the canal. Then you place the gutta percha cone. Don't move it up and down or you'll incorporate air bubbles. And then this is the, the heater and I'm searing it off in the canal with the heater. Now here's the second canal and I'm squirting the BC sealer in there under a little bit of pressure then using the heater heating element to sear it off then coming back with a small plugger and plugging it into the canal. And then here's the third canal and the uh, MB2. There's the MB2 and honestly I would say if I get the MB2 more than just a little niblet more than 30 percent of the time that's a lot most of the time the mb2 is not that is not consequential and if it is if if it is there it joins the mesial buccal canal very quickly and so i try to clean it out and sometimes i'll just inject sealer under pressure into the mb2 canal and my endodontic success as far as i know in the last 20 years, I mean 30, 20, 25 years is 100%. I can't ever remember losing a tooth that I've performed endodontics on that tooth with this technique. So I'm then using a plugger. This is IRM. I use that as a bulk buildup material because it's easy. Some people say, well, does that interfere with the set of the composite? I've been using this for 40 years and it's never interfered with the set of the composite because I let it set completely if I'm placing a composite. Say I'm performing endodontics on an anterior tooth where you don't want to 
uh, perform a crown on that tooth. And many times you'll just leave it with endo in a composite buildup. Well, I'll place the IRM under the composite, let it set completely, go check a hygiene patient, something like that while it sets up and then place the composite. And I've never had an issue with the eugenol in the IRM affecting the set of the composite buildup. So in this case, I'm not using composite, I'm just using the IRM. This is a fantastic instrument for composites, for IRM. It's shaped like an egg, and this round end is just perfect for smoothing the buildup into the tooth, into the margins of the tooth. Okay, so then we're not showing the crown in this case. I finish prepping the tooth and take the impression for the crown and seat the crown. And there's the endodontic procedure. Wonderful. Patients don't have post-op pain. Uh, knock on wood. I've never had an issue with it, and I've been using this single drill technique for probably three or four years. Use the other real-world endo technique with multiple drills for probably 15 years. So it really works. It cleans it. The, the key to endo is cleaning it out and irrigating it well. And remember, the sealer is the thing that seals the canal. The gutta percha only moves the sealer into all parts of the canals. The sealer is the key thing, but the cleaning of the canal is the most important thing. So if you can get it really cleaned out with your sodium hypochlorite and your uh, hand files and your uh, drill, your single drill, you're going to have successful, you're going to have a bunch of successful endodontic techniques. That's the Dental Minute. These techniques work and they work every time.